hello. Welcome to Staring into the Abyss. I'm your host, Richard Gerlach. With me, as always, is Matt Brandenburg. I'm just sitting here drawing a picture of a door. Oh, you drawing anything, Vitlame? I find that interesting because I'm drawing the exact same door. With a, it's just a rectangle with a circle on, in the middle. <laughs> Are you copying me? <laughs> me I'm not. I, I live in a freaking different continent than you. <laughs> I know you have cameras. And I'm drawing the same, <laughs> I'm drawing the same exact thing too. This is this is weird. This is getting I'm, weird, guys. It, it's very weird. Today we're gonna be discussing the story Venio by Gemma Files. You can find this story on Pseudopod. It was also in um, Vasterian magazine, and it's in Gemma's collection. In I believe it's called In Darkness, Our End. You can also find the story in that collection too. I have that collection. That's why I remember it's in there. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a really, really fun story yes. about ghosts and liminal spaces, and while you probably shouldn't have play games with with uh stuff beyond our knowledge <laughs> and also uh writing and having yeah. a writers group <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. always but pick it... the right writers to have with you you guys <laughs> yeah. i think that's basically the common thing about this <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i think so too well and it's funny that you bring this up because i think it was the first issue of Vestarian that I had received it was like right when I subscribed to it and so this came out at tw- I think you even said 2019 so a long long time ago um oh, pre the pre-covid times pre-covid yeah P- pc um <laughs> and, and so I I it's funny when you brought it here to us to read because like it, it instantly reminded me and it, so it did stick with me the whole time. So these last four years or so, it, it's always been in the back of my head. And so yeah. it was fun to read. It was really fun to revisit just to. It's, it's a really good story. Like I think Gemma files is a great short story writer and she's a really good novelist too, but she has a lot more short stories than she has novels. And her st- her work is seriously wonderful. If you haven't read it yet, like, fix that now. Yeah, I did. I just picked up Experimental uh, Experimental Film. Is that the right one? Yeah. Title? yeah. Yes. So I'm excited to uh, get into that one again. Because I think I read that when it came out. But, again, that was a while ago. So it would be <laughs> good to reread it. All right. Well, before we dive deep into Venio, we can go over some of our recommendations for media. It's been a couple weeks, so I have consumed a lot, and I'm not going to go over everything that I've consumed. But I will say I'm nearing the end of my heart as a chainsaw, and I'm absolutely loving that book. Like, I'm I'm sure he sticks the landing, but my heart is a chainsaw so far. Very good read. Yes. that And that's the first one of the trilogy, right? Yes. Yes. I read that one. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I remember. <laughs> I'm like, because I know he's got Don't Fear the Reaper. And I was like, oh, I'm trying to remember. I don't think I read that one. But yeah, I really liked him. Um, yeah. My Heart is a Chainsaw. I thought it was it's, cool. It's really, really good. It's a great home as slasher movies. Yeah. And it gives you lots of, of homework and recommendations. Yeah. You get lots of movie recommendations from it. <laughs> <laughs> and besides that, I went and saw Talk to Me last night or oh. yesterday afternoon. I have seen the trailer and it looks really good. Tell it me is so. fantastic. Nice. It's easily one of the best horror movies I've seen all year. No, not even nice. joking. Nice, nice. Um, it is intense. It has some good, good practical effects, some good effects work. And it's an interesting take on the um, possession story as well. Yes. It's like they take they take the familiar trip of ghost possession and they they do something interesting with it. Which is good. We're at that point where we need that. Especially because there's all these possession movies coming out now. Yeah. <laughs> so many. Like, my friend and I went to go see Talk To Me, and there was, like, 
The new Exorcist movie. Yeah. The Nun 2. And something else that I forget, but it's just like, <laughs> I'm tired. Somebody gets possessed. And it's just like, give us something different. Like, take take these old tropes and give us something new. And that's what Talk To Me does. The the premise is these kids in Australia have this porcelain hand with writing all over it. And... Underneath underneath the hand, they say, is the embalmed hand of a medium that could connect to the dead. Mm-hmm. You hold hands with the hand, and you say, talk to me. And you see a spirit on the other side. <laughs> and the spirit will answer any question that you ask it. Like it. And then you say, let me in. And the spirit will temporarily possess you, or fully possess you. And they time it for 90 seconds. And then they stop it after 90 seconds. Because if it's any longer than 90 seconds, the spirit wants to stay. And these kids are just bringing this hand to parties and playing ghost possession like they're getting high. (laughs) Yep, that sounds about right. (laughs) That is such an awesome Because apparently it feels amazing when, like, like, you're doing it. (laughs) I mean, this kind of feels... In like in tandem with what is happening, like with what's happening with the world right now, like people like I think it was like yesterday or the day before that the government was admitting that aliens exist and people like, uh, I mean, can I pay my rent? No, fuck off. (laughs) Yeah. So it's it's basically that kind of vibe. You're like, we don't care. Fuck my fuck. I mean, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that is that is how talk to me kind of kind of plays out. Um, it is intense. It's got some good. It's a, not super gory, but it's got a good face ba- face bashing scene. Oh, excellent. I'm always for that. So if you, and it's really intense. Like there's not much comedic relief. It's a very serious, like horror movie that is honestly really, really just a mood in itself. But by the end, it just, I don't know, it just nails everything. Like, it's one of those movies that comes out swinging and it hits every single thing it's going for. <laughs> so how is they it recommend the left, it? Is it the left hand or the is right one? hand? Is it the left hand or the right hand? I forget. <laughs> I think it's, uh, I don't know. I forget, honestly. (laughs) I'm just wondering which hand they say is the possession hand. (laughs) (laughs) I also, and this is completely different, but remember a couple years ago, that movie that came out, Shin Godzilla? Yes. I think so. So I found out that Hidaki Anno had been working on a series of movies that was like rebooting old properties that he was calling the Shin movies. Nice. And he had Shin Godzilla, Shin Ultraman, which is a giant Japanese rubber man, man in rubber suit fighting monster type shows. (laughs) And he also did Shin Kamen Rider which is another like Japanese man in rubber suit fighting monster shows. (laughs) And I watched Shin Kamen Rider the other day. And that movie's a fucking trip. (laughs) It it was comedically or no, no, it it plays itself very straight. Excellent. Like it, it takes itself very seriously. It's on Prime as Shin Mask Rider because Kamen okay. Rider's Mask Rider, um, and pretty much the, the the movie itself, and Vitlame can attest to this with Japanese storytelling. Mm-hmm. A lot of the Japanese storytelling, when it deals with popular culture, they just expect you to know. Mm-hmm. So this movie doesn't explain shit. 
Yep. <laughs> it, just, it just expects you to go with the flow or know what the fuck are talking about. Yep. They're, they, 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 it's so annoying when they do that. Yeah, so, so the, movie, the movie opens, you know, typically, like, in the American superhero movie, we'd have, like, the opening scene would be the origin of our hero, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. This movie opens on a car chase. <laughs> where then our yeah, main it's... character kills, literally punches in heads, like, caves in heads with his fists of all the oh, people geez. that he's fighting against. Then the movie goes, Shin Kamen Rider with a title card. And then he's chasing the bad guy into this house. Yes. We don't know why why this is happening. We don't know who this is. We don't know anything. <laughs> but, like, if you're a Japanese person, you understand Kamen Rider. You understand, like, what's, what's, what everything happening is. And they, they explain a few things. But then there's some stuff they just don't explain at all. And you're just kind of like left to try to figure out what what's going on. Um, but it is a wild ride. It's yeah. literally they took he took the main storyline of a 98 episode TV series and turned it into a two hour movie. We're like, you're watching a movie that's going by monster of the week storylines. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it so much. Is he like planning like a, to tie them all together? Uh, he says they all take place in the same universe. Okay. Like um, that. And he also said he wants to do an, a sequel to Shin Kamen Rider. But um, he's taking a break after working for like 30 plus years nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. mean, th- this 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 is a guy who's been working in the anime industry since the 80s. Like how? Like he was one of the founding animators for Studio Ghibli. Wow. And then he, he directed live action movies. He's directed anime movies. He made the anime Neon Genesis Evangelion is what he's really famous for. Oh, I don't think I realized that. Okay. Yeah. And the the, the new Neon Genesis Evangelion movies, he also writes and directs those too. Holy crap. Yeah. Maybe he does need a break. <laughs> so Shin, Shin Kamen Rider is a live action movie. It's it's does have some cheesy CGI. It has it, it's it's shot like a 70s Japanese TV show with the stylings of modern filmmaking. Like, there's one part where, and this is still the beginning, our main character is trapped inside the building. And it's about to explode. And he's trying to get his helmet on because his helmet activates his powers. The building explodes, and the camera cuts to him trapped. The camera cuts outside of the building exploding. Then the camera cuts to him somersaulting in the air, landing on his feet and running away. <laughs> <laughs> oh that is perfect so it's like it, it's just like like the fact that take it plays it straight and makes all these moments better because it just adds to like the vibe and cheesiness of it all that like makes it more enjoyable i think <laughs> um it's on prime if anyone wants to watch it i thought it was a good time it's got some good gore it's got some good fight scenes, and if you do like Common Rider, it's a really good love letter to Common Rider. Nice. And then I just got two more, and then I'll go over to you guys. I also, in my lack of control, binged Twisted Metal over the last two days. <laughs> Which, yes, they made a TV show based on the Twisted Metal video game. <laughs> Which is a little unexpected. <laughs> yeah little bit and it's some of the most fun i've had watching tv all year it is it is a blast it looks it looks like a lot of fun it's by one of the writers behind zombieland and deadpool (laughs) all right so it has that kind of zombieland deadpool vibe going for it it follows our main character who's john doe played by anthony mackie who is a post-apocalyptic delivery man. 
<laughs> who has to go across the country to deliver a mysterious package. <laughs> and some some famous twist metal characters show up, especially Sweet Tooth has a pretty big role in the show. He's a giant murderer in a clown mask who drives an ice cream truck. <laughs> it was always fun to play in the video game. He was always fun to play the video games. In the show, he's voiced by Will Arnett. <laughs> 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 but he's played by um, Samoa Joe, the wrestler. But because he's wearing a mask the whole time, it's just Will Arnett's voice on that over the mask. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, they're, he's actually one of the funniest characters of the show. He's a blast to watch. Like, his first encounter... So, like, his ver- the first encounter with him, when people go to Las Vegas, which is kind of the city that he, he controls, he invites them to his show. And he's a very menacing guy. Our main character and him bond over the thong song by Cisco. <laughs> Okay. Who he calls the silver haired God. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then he has them watch his one man show, which is him. He lives in a Las Vegas hotel and his one man show is just him acting out the different services pages for the advertisements of the oh, hotel man. that put on loop in the lobby. That is the best. And then he he goes down and he's like, what did you think of my show? And John Doe's like, I loved it. I thought it was great. And then he like gets super threatening. And then this uh, woman who he who John Doe meets, who goes called Quiet, she just goes, it was the biggest piece of shit I've ever seen in my life. And frankly, it was beneath you. And he's like, what did you say? And she's like, I thought it sucked really bad. And then he goes back to John Doe, and he's like, do you share her opinion? And he's like, yeah, it was fucking terrible, man. And then he just puts some machete down. He's like, thank you for telling me the truth. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that just sounds amazing. And, like, they become best friends. (laughs) (laughs) Like... The show itself, like it, it has its dark moments, but it's really kind of going for a bit kind of zaniness and comedy. You got lots of car stunts, and you got a, <clears throat> a good heaping of gore on the side too. It's a pretty gory show at points. And the last thing I would say I recommend would have to be uh, Oppenheimer, which all I gotta say is it looked really beautiful to see in the cinema, and the bomb went boom. <laughs> the bomb went boom but no for real like Oppenheimer is a really good character study I thought it was a really good movie where Robert Downey Jr. actually gives one of his best performances that's crazy so like and Robert Downey Jr. like everyone in the movie's great but I'm just saying like in terms of Robert Downey Jr. performances this is one of his best the worst part of the movie is Matt Damon has a terrible mustache <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I should say, it's not so much that the that he has a terrible mustache. It's more so that Matt Damon's not really the type of guy that could pull a mustache off. <laughs> <laughs> Shots fired. Which I, I will also say something funny about Matt, Matt Damon is he was doing an interview recently and his daughter refuses to like watch any of his good movies. So, like, they were at, like, Thanksgiving or whatever, and his daughter was, like, in front of everybody, and she was like, I watched that movie, what was it called, The Wall, where you're in China, and Matt Damon's like, you mean The Great Wall? And she just went, there's something great about that movie. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, uh, she's right. I mean, she is right. I actually saw that movie in China. Oh no! <laughs> were they police the Chinese? No, they were not. They did most people who watched that movie were like, "This movie sucked." Oh, thank God! <laughs> because it ha- because I mean, I mean, it sucks for them because it was funded by the Chinese government. Yeah, yeah. My friend, my friend Tusa, she was like, um, she was like, what was it? She just went, "The monsters looked cool," <laughs> and that was all she could say. 
Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I that's kind of my, that came out. That's a wrap up for the week. I will also say I have more, but I want to keep it light. So, Matt, what about you? Well, uh, let's see. We'll start with uh, I read Laird Barron's The Wind Began to Howl, uh, oh, which what? is it's great. It's a great little book. It, I think I can't remember how long it is, but it's not very long. Uh, in fact, it's even called like 3.5. So it's like a in between on the bigger story of Isaiah, Isaiah Coleridge, but it's a fun uh, little romp with him. And it's the basic idea is there is this uh, film, the, this like av- avant garde filmmaker who's making this really weird, dark kind of thing. And he had partnered with these kind of like black metal musicians, um, kind of ambient monstery sound thing. And the musicians had disappeared, but they need them to sign a contract because this movie is focused on one of their albums. And like a long time ago, the the musician said, yeah, sure, you can use it. But now lawyers and stuff, they want to make sure it's right. So he has to go find them and it, this, you know, it, it, I think we've talked about this before with the Isaiah Coolridge stuff where like the first book was very mystery focused and then slowly Laird added in his more cosmic stuff. And yeah. um, this is the same, this, it, this is a good, a good balance between it. Uh, there's definitely a lot of cosmic stuff, but it's a little bit more focused on just this kind of mystery, which doesn't sound like, much it's just him trying to find these two guys but it he really covers kind of what um these two were digging into and what they kind of were uh exploring um (laughs) with their music and and a broader sense they sounded very cult like figures that were into a lot of the stuff that actually is in some of the earlier books this definitely ties into those other ones. I don't think you need to read those other ones. If you just randomly pick this up for some reason, uh, you would be fine. You get the basic gist of his story, Isaiah's story, and then what he's dealt with. But reading the other ones definitely gives you more into this. Some of the, I think it's the Zyrecom Corporation makes an appearance. And then some of the other kind of shady things that Isaiah dealt with it previously kind of are tangentially tied to these two musicians and what they're trying. And um, yeah, it, it's got some great action scenes in it. it I, I really like this more so for this exploration on Isaiah Coolidge getting older. And so he's dealing with his body's not the same as it once was. So he's feeling the pain of getting beat up all the time and of doing these long treks and all these different things. His body it is definitely taking a toll and you're definitely seeing that in this. And, you know, I think it's kind of cool that Laird put that stuff in there for this one was just to, you can kind of see where he's probably going to go with maybe this next book. If he comes out with another one, which I hope he does. So it, it it was it was good. It's definitely worth picking up. It was great getting a new Laird Baring book because of everything that's been going on with him. So it's it was very exciting to get back into this. But yeah, you know, I think I I, I liked it. I'm trying to <laughs> think. It, it it's fun. It actually it ties into the next book I read, which Rich, I know you've read, was uh, David Peake's Corpse Paint. Oh, which... dude, Corpse Paint's so fucking good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I like it, it, it. Man, that one's bleak, which I shouldn't have been surprised because it's David P. Dude, like the, that ending. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like uh, every page, I'm like, damn. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> it, he he uh, knows how to, where to go with some really dark thoughts and everything. Um, listeners, for you, if you've not read Corpse Paint, about a black metal band (laughs) is and specifically this lead singer who is 
very messed up uh, on drugs, very egomaniac, thinks he's the best thing in the world, fires all of his other musicians, is famous for just going off and being really just insane and crazy. Story opens up with him basically getting invited to uh, the Ukraine to record at this famous recording studio for this other famous kind of dark metal band. And he, like, he, they, the studio and the recording company hire a drummer who's supposed to be a really good drummer. And so this drummer is going with our music, our lead singer, whose name I'm totally drawing a blank on right now. And so the two of them go to Ukraine and it's, they're basically in this like compound and the band that owns the studio, is kind of running like a, just their own off the grid community. And they have plans for the rest of the world because the rest of the world is not following the right things. <laughs> and so it's just, it, it, and just a, a tough, tough nihilistic, the world sucks and everyone's terrible and we need to wipe clean um, everybody it, thoughts are throughout this whole book. <laughs> um, it's uh, very, very dark, very bleak. And it's, uh, it's just, I love David Peak. I think everything he writes is just absolutely amazing. He's got such uh, like style, like these, sto like this corpse paint, there's times where you're, it, he's just, very matter of fact of somebody getting stabbed in the stomach just like you you're not even ready for it it just happens and then it continues to happen or somebody just uh yeah goes really deep into drugs and just starts seeing really messed up dark things and there's just, just it, it it and like rich like you said the ending just i i wasn't ready for that ending <laughs> dude that ending is so fucked up <laughs> like 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 no no one's prepared for like it's it's all fucked up in a way where like i think when people if if we say oh that's fucked up people are like oh thinking of just something super violent or something super gross in a book like no this is like psychologically fucked up like this is yeah. like this is just it's just dark and uncomfortable and it just yeah. leaves you feeling bad oh i yeah. love that it's yeah like they and, uh, yeah <laughs> it, it's, it's what it needs to be like i i don't care like i love that david peak isn't afraid to to go to places that just make you feel like shit yeah like, like and I, this is in a good way like yeah like, like after i after i read corpus pain i just wanted a cold shower yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, like because it it, it 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 and it all works. And what's what's interesting is he puts in again. It's a little cosmic at points because this like group, basically they're a militia. You know, they believe in these old ways, and these old ways include kind of the this view of a ancient god that hides between the stars and is we're just dust uh, to this god and. And like he, you know, the Christianity got it all like got most of it wrong, except about the Leviathan eating of worlds and all this stuff. And and so like this militia is very much just like we need to kind of live the old ways and the rest of the world hasn't lived the old ways. And where some of the cosmic stuff comes in besides that is just this music that comes out and what the plan for this music is, is just to make people go crazy. But this militia also has the plan that most militias have, and it's not great. And this, uh, the the ending goes into detail on what this militia is prepared and going and doing as we read it. And you're like, holy crap! <laughs> so yeah, that was a uh, the the combo of the two were interesting because it both was dealing with this kind of dark metal and what that what music even we'll, we'll look beyond the dark metal part of it and just look at what music can do and and like how i can get into your head and what were what what things mean which is fun for the gemophile story we're going to talk about um soon but 
yeah, I think uh, I think those are the main things. I did read Brian Asman's Nunchuck City, which was a fun, lighthearted romp uh, about ninjas and Turbo City and fighting and trying to create a fondue fast food takeout place and uh, just Brian Asman having fun. And I needed it after the last two. So I feel that. Uh, Bill May, what about you? Okay, um, I didn't. I forgot. To, we we were discussing last time about Indiana Jones, and I completely forgot to mention that I actually had seen, had gone and went and seen the fifth movie, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. How was oh, it? Yeah. How was it? I really liked it. I mean, it it kind of felt like they took the hint from the catastrophe that is the fourth movie <laughs> and made it better because it's just, it has a lot of action. It just, it basically starts with full blown action right at the beginning, right at the beginning. And uh, it just feels in very, like in connection with the other like three movies It like, it ha- like it has heart. It has this mystique about these things. It has to chase, and of course, Injun Jones beating up Nazis. I mean, that's basically the core thing of Injun Jones. You gotta have the Nazi thing, and uh, it has lovable characters. Um, the 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 female lead is amazing. <laughs> She's so fun. It's the actress who did um, fuck. Uh, what's it called? Heartsick? No. It's, uh, I'm I'm blanking out right now. It's like uh, yeah. It, Wasn't she it's in cool. um Phoebe? Uh, Phoebe uh, mm-hmm. What is? It? Yep. See, see. God She's damn it. Yeah. That is it Phoebe? Phoebe Waller Bridge? Phoebe Waller? Is it Phoebe Waller Bridges? I think That's so. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we'll take that. Yeah, I think it's her. Yeah. She's really fun. Like her, like. She's definitely not a, like a, like uh, Willie was in the Temple of Doom, like a, a damsel in distress. <laughs> no, she takes action like right off the bat. She has a connection with Indy, which is really nice. And uh, yeah, she's really funny. She was like, eh, I mean, I'm in trouble, but I can I I I can figure things out myself. I don't I don't need you. <laughs> and but at the same time, Indy's like, well, I have a responsibility for you, and she's like. I'm a grown ass woman. I'm fine. <laughs> um, yeah. What, what was really interesting also was the um, how they managed to do the AI thing with it, like making his face younger. You like in the beginning, like the, like I said, the start of the action with him uh, around 1945, I think. Like at the end, like at the end of World War II. Mm-hmm. And he's supposed to be, I think, in his 50s there. It, yeah. It looks like I'm scared because it looks so good. <laughs> oh, no. It, it looked like <laughs> it basically looked like how he looked in um, The Last Crusade. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It was, that's why I was like, okay, they are really progressing with the AI here. I'm not, I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> It's like I'm impressed, but I'm scared. <laughs> but you could definitely see and hear from the poor guy. I mean, Harrison is about maybe eighty. He's eighty years old. Yeah. And you can see, like, when he's there, like he is moving a bit clumsily, and his voice is in like tune with his age. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't really match the AI face construction and everything. And there's this scene like where he's uh, so supposed to be like jumping from trains or running on uh, top of the train, and you and it's just it's so clumsy. And I was like, why didn't you get the fucking stuntman to do that? <laughs> like why? Because he looked so tired just from taking a couple of steps. And I'm like, oh no, oh, you're supposed no. to you're be fit. Watch- you're supposed to be fit, Andy. <laughs> Did you ever watch um, The Irishman? Either you or Matt? No. No. So they did the same thing in The Irishman where Scorsese de-aged Robert De Niro. Oh, yeah, wait, I've heard about that, yeah. And Robert De Niro looked just like he did in the 70s. Mm-hmm. There's a scene where, like, 
he's kicking somebody who's lying on the ground, and you can tell he's an old man kicking somebody. Yeah. <laughs> yep. he, he can't have that same movement that he could yeah. have had when he was like in his 20s or 30s. Yeah, exactly. So it was like, eh, that was a weird choice, but nonetheless, it was a lot of fun. Like, it really definitely hits the nostalgia part. And just the end was really, really heartfelt and nice. And I really enjoyed it. I was like, yeah, just now let it end, please. Yeah. And and please, for the love of God, don't make Chris Path be the next indie. Oh, God. I will murder someone if so, uh, that will happen. <laughs> because if anything, if they want to continue with the franchise, they should continue with the female male lead. Yeah. Because she had, like, she's an archaeologist too. Like, she basically went into the same footsteps as Indy. And she's got the chops. So I'm like, please, if you're going to continue, just make it with her. She's awesome. Yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, what else? Oh, I, last week I, I, dis- I finally watched uh, Evil Dead Rise. <laughs> oh, what did you think of that? I really, again, I enjoyed it because it has nostalgia. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I I did I did like the uh, nod to Bruce Campbell like with the with the recording. I oh, kind of nice. felt I kind of felt like I was Leonardo DiCaprio from Once Upon a Time in Mexico. I was like, yeah, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> like, see, see, I I remember the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, but yeah, it was it was super gory. I really enjoyed that. I probably must be pretty damn desensitized because I was more or less laughing at the scenes more than being disgusted oh, or I, being scared. I was in the, I was laughing at the scenes in the, in the theater. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> so we're, we're both pretty fucked up. That's amazing. Yeah, I was in the theater laughing at like everything. Yeah, I thought it was hilarious. I was like, wow, this is so gory. This is so funny. Why is my laughing? But I liked it. It was like it. It was it. It was kind of like both a nod to the old ones and a good mix into modern times. I loved. I loved the uh, final fight, the chainsaw fight in the parking garage. Yes. It was. I kept thinking about like, oh god, the poor little girl is so traumatized after this. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna be surprised if she's gonna be able to talk after all this. <laughs> Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be really mad, or like I would sympathize with her if she decided to be selective mute after this. <laughs> um, what really bothered me, though, there was one thing that, and this is a nitpick. I feel like they should not have put, like, the text at the beginning of the, like, when the when the text um, when the title rises comes, and then after that it comes like one day earlier. I feel they should have yeah. omitted that because then the ending would have been like, oh shit, really? This is what happened? Oh. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, because when it happens, you're like, wait, what the fuck's going on? Yeah, yeah, because at the beginning of the movies, you're like, oh, these are two characters. And then suddenly the movie ships to another. And you're like, wait, what? What's happening? Well, the, the title, it's, it's because you get that awesome title card when she's rising on the lake and it's like, yeah, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so I yeah I feel like they should have omitted the 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 thing like the text like one day earlier because yeah it it might have like it would have, it would have heightened the reveal a lot more at the end and like it would have been more enjoyable especially like when you see like the girl being possessed at the end you're like oh shit that's what happens <laughs> <laughs> but I yeah I really like that one. Then I uh, we started watching uh, the, the season eleven of Futurama. Oh, how is it? Well, I, they they only so just released I, I one episode. Watched half of the first episode. Yeah, <laughs> I talked over you, Vit LeMay. I say I watched half of the first episode, but Vit LeMay, say again because I talked over you. That's okay. I just uh, it was yeah. They just released one episode, so they that's that's the only thing that's available now. So maybe maybe on Monday we'll get episode two. I don't know, Rich. What do you? What did you think? I thought it was okay. I thought it was meh. Aww. I thought, yeah, like I'd say, like I'll watch the next episode, but I feel like Futurama was a show that didn't need to come back. Right. 
That's what I was wondering. And like, I like Futurama. I'm not saying anything bad about Futurama, but I it also like because what what struck me the wrong way was at first I was like cool, and then I saw they didn't want to pay John DiMaggio the money, yeah, mm-hmm. and they wanted to cast somebody else as Bender. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, as soon as that happened, I was like, oh, I don't know if I have faith in this. Uh, yep. <laughs> new, yeah. new season. It's but um, I thought it was okay. Uh, yeah. Well, the Futurama is one of my favorite shows ever. Like, I can just this is one of my best comfort shows. If I want to see something that makes me happy or want to like me make me cry or something, I will watch Futurama because well, Futurama they. Futurama is great. I love it so yeah. much. Yeah, it's so good. I agree that they should have stopped at season 10 because they had the most, the best ending I ever seen. It was so sweet. It was just so wholesome. And I was like, this is awesome. It made you feel like, oh, I wish I could have had more. But at the same time, you're like, you know what? This was a good run. This was great. Yeah. But now, yeah. but now they've, they they just want to milk every fucking thing. And I was like, stop milking things that's already dry. <laughs> yeah. And um, the teat the teat has run out of milk. The teat is dry and crumbly. <laughs> Sorry, it's just yeah. I I just watched yeah. I when I when I watched the first episode, it just immediately hit me like they they start they started the show by making fun of it like hey it's been ten years but we're back again and you're like huh okay. And then they kept that joke for three, four times throughout the episode. Yeah. And I was like, no. The episode is kind of making fun of binging, like binging streaming thing. Yeah. And I was like, that's sorry. That's not funny. If they're going to make fun of COVID, I'm going to be so fucking pissed. Oh, God. I hope not. Yeah. And and also, I felt like the production value was not as good as the others. Like, they were really static most of the time. There's not as much movement as I saw saw in the other like and the other seasons. Yeah, and no, I felt I felt something similar too when I was watching it. Exactly, and, and this is this is not on the, this is not a, like their fault or anything like that. But you can really hear how the voice actor of Fry Farnsworth and um, Soidberg he's he's really old now, oh, and you can and you can hear it in his voice. Yeah, like well, when, well, like, yeah, Billy, yeah, Billy West, yeah, his like his voice, like I love him. He's like the the best fucking voice actor that I know of. But he's old now. I think he's in his seventies or something. And you can hear it in the voice. <laughs> not, 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 not just in Fry, but also in in Farnsworth. And I was like, this is kind of ruining my moment with them. Yeah. And, it's not, and it's not the, his fault because, of course, you're aging. That's natural. But this is why I'm like, you shouldn't have brought them back. Yeah. All right. I, is David Cohen, well, I think it's David X. Cohen and, and Matt Groney. Are they all tied yeah. to it still? Okay. I don't know if they're still tied to it. But, I, but you know, during this, uh, the, t- the title sequence, it's their names are still there. Mm-hmm. But I'm not I mean, sure that... because. They own the IP yeah. for Futurama. Yeah, I think it's that. So, okay. I'm checking to see if they're still involved. I mean, I think Matt is more focused on Disenchantment, right? I think so, too. I mean, and he should, because I actually love that show, so please continue with it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they uh, decided to bring it back. It, it's kind of sad. Yeah, it is because it's been ten years since they since they stopped, like since season two, since ten stopped. So yeah, I've also apps for reading. I started um, Philip Fracassi's uh, The Boys in the Valley. Oh, oh I'm nice. starting that next. I just got the audiobook downloaded. Mm-hmm. I'm almost finished. I'm like on part four. Like I have like two hours left of the audiobook. How the na- the narrator is amazing. He Ooh. can he can really like he can change his voice like for every single character, which is great. I love I love it when narrators do that because then you can kind of like picture yourself or like at least point to which character is which. 
Yeah. And as it, for it just the, adds to it. Yeah, exactly. As for the story, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a bit disappointed. Oh. Not to say that Philip Fugazi's writing is awesome. It's really good. But I was kind of led astray. Oh. Because I thought, and I think some people were like, I don't know if, I don't want to say who because I don't want to point them, but someone said that they kind of reminded them of Salem's Lot. Hmm. And I jumped at the fact. I was like, oh, I love Salem's Lot. Give me. <laughs> but it's not. Oh, boo. So it's more a religious horror possession thing. And I'm like, eh. <laughs> I'm, it's probably just my fucking agnostic side here, but I'm like, I, this doesn't scare me. <laughs> <laughs> and it just gets boring. Uh-huh. And and you know I know that like they're like these are boys. This happens in an orphanage. I think I think sometime after the Civil War or something like that. Like in the nineteen hundred, like at the beginning of the nineteen hundreds, I think. And like yeah, this is not like an old boys orphanage, and these are kids. And I'm like yeah, what happened to them is horrible. But these are still kids, you know. You can just <laughs> you can just fucking throw them against the wall. Or something. <laughs> Oh, I get it. When they're possessed, not just that when they're normal. Kids. Yeah, 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 yeah. When they're possessed, I'm like, when, I'm when like, the normal kids too. When the normal kids too. <laughs> because I mean, I don't find them scary, you know. Yeah. It, it like when I was starting, like when it started, it like it built it built up nice, and I'm like, okay. But then when they when the chaos started, I'm like, eh, it's like basically rowdy boys. <laughs> I don't, I'm not feeling the horror here. Like there's this, well, I mean, I will say that there was, there was this one death that really shook me. That was really bad. Like it was horrible, but the rest I'm like, eh, okay. I'm a, yeah, that's why I was like, I, I, I actually came here because I thought this was going to be like a vampire thing. So I'm, I'm a bit disappointed. So pretty much what it is is your expectations were for one thing, and it wasn't what your expectations. Yeah. But is it still enjoyable despite not living up to your expectations? I mean, I'm still listening to it. I haven't DNF it, so yeah. Well, that's good then. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I am invested enough to see what what they're gonna do because they're basically trapped in a snow snowstorms in the orphanage, and the possessed kids are going wild. <laughs> Which is fine. The yeah, um, self-righteous people are gonna do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but at the same time, I'm like, eh, maybe bump it up a little bit, make them more creepy. I mean, they're not creepy. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it just I kept it kept running in my head. Like I told I told you guys about how bad the fucking possession thing was in in the Exorcist Pope, uh, the Pope's yeah. Exorcist. Yeah, yeah. It, I I just kept like that kind of thing. Just uh, that. I mean, they made an effort to make them at least look creepy. And this is just basically, um, they don't. There's no basic, no kind of like. There's nothing to showcase that they are possessed. To say like it reminds me of the children and the children of the corn. Oh, okay. Like, so they don't have weird eyes or weird skin or anything. No, no, nothing yeah. like that. Nothing like that. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, which is interesting because one of the characters who was one of the good guys, he did mention, like, they don't look weak. They just look mad. They are mad about the conditions that we're in. We're starving here, and we don't have a life. And I'm like, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, wouldn't you be pretty fucking mad? Yeah. <laughs> So, like, at this point, I'm like, I'm not seeing the horror or the evil about these kids, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's because I've, like, witnessed so much depravity, like, in the world, I'm like, I mean, this feels normal. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, yeah, I am going to finish it, but, like, like I said, the writing is really good. I mean, Philip, he can't do no, he can do nothing wrong, but... Yeah, my expectations were completely thrown up. 
But now that's not to say that people who like religious horror and like possession horror are not going to like it. It's just yeah. not my cup. It's just yeah, not my cup. It's just not my cup of tea. You 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 prefer? Well, everyone has their own preferences. Yeah, exactly. Note, note, Matt. We're gonna give Vitlame lots of religious horror for the rest of the. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't mind religious horror. Just give me something besides fucking Christianity, man. Yeah. Have you like, ever? Oh, there, there's a movie I got for you, Vitlame. Oh. It's on Shutter. I don't have Shutter. Damn it. Yeah. What do you think I would be doing after I'm done talking with you guys? I would probably lie on t- on my couch watching every fucking horror movie, but I can't because I don't have Shutter. Well, if you can ever find access to a movie called The Medium. Oh, I've heard about that one. Yeah, I really want to watch it. I probably might ask it's, it's my husband. A horror movie from the perspective of Thai shit Buddhism? Oh, I mean, yeah, give me. I like that. I mean, I also enjoyed the movie The Golem. Oh, yeah. I, re- I really like that one. So, but yeah, no, because because we're, we're just used to the whole um, The Exorcist. It kind of painted the whole possession thing. Yeah. And demon possession is this whole big thing in Christianity. Yeah. And America loves its Christianity. Yep. This is why demon possession became such a thing. Did you know that the Catholic, the, the of the Catholic, the author of The Exorcist, considered The Exorcist to be Catholic propaganda? Really? Because huh. the novels about losing faith and finding faith and regaining your faith in Jesus, and that's what kind of drives the demon Pazuzu away from Regan with the father's regained faith, and um. The the author was very 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 Catholic. Hmm. I mean, um, I think it makes sense when you when she put it out, when they put it out that way. Yeah. Yeah. The, the movie the movie didn't retain any of that. The movie was just a little child vomiting green pea soup. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the the book is I guess I've read the book. The book's very heavily about like what faith means and what it means to lose faith and then regain faith and all that stuff is a big, big, big thing in the novel, which in some ways is kind of beautiful, but other ways it's like, I bet this dude would have voted for Trump motherfucker. So, (laughs) (laughs) yep. but I think we should go over to our writing games and discuss video by Gemma files, (laughs) which I'm happy this is your first Gemma Files story, Vitlame. Yeah. If I may make a suggestion after this podcast, we've already done a podcast on the story, but she has a story for free online called Each P every P oh each piece I show everything I show you is a piece of my death. Oh. Yeah. That one's really and good. that is a fantastic epistolary short story. Hmm. Let me just check it out. But video is a story yeah. that deals with the power of the mind and spirits and something else out there. Mm-hmm. And while we should play these fucking games and summon these things into our presence. <laughs> they didn't even need to summon it. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know about you guys, but did you get like a It Follows vibes from it? Yes. Yes. Right. I'm not the only one. I thought I the entire time that I was reading this, I I kept thinking this needs to be put like made into a short film. Please and thank you. Yeah, I think they could do something really cool with it. Yes. Because everything was visceral and I just love being in the in the headspace of Chris. Yeah. And just seeing it through her mind. And then just her reasoning at the end was just superb. Yeah. Well, and I love too, and this is, I think, having read that other story, <laughs> um, she, Gemma Files is this really cool thing of like bringing you in in like a unique way. I, she does a lot of that like found footage stuff. And um, 
where you're kind of like witnessing something. And that's the same for this. It like starts right out where she's just talking to you and like the hints throughout of what she's doing all the way up to the end is like, she's messing with you as the reader. And I think that's such a fun, like active way to get you in. Like she could have easily just cut out the Mm. stuff and it could, it still would be a really good story just about these people. Yeah. Trying a writing prompt, but then to throw in this idea of like, oh, it's something more. And I'm writing this to get it to you as the reader. Yeah. It's really cool. I, I, yeah, definitely. Because you, yeah, at the beginning, you are pulled in. And then you kind of also just get immersed into the storytelling. And then at the end, you reminded, like, oh shit, I'm a part of this too. Yeah. <laughs> it's happening to me. <laughs> yeah. It, it it also has like the ring vibes to it. Like definitely the end. Like yeah. the rings, the ring incantation, like definitely that kind of vibe. <laughs> I was getting a little bit nervous at the end. I was like, oh fuck. I don't believe it's this shit, but should I be worried? Should I be having yeah. <laughs> like should I be worried that I might have these kind of dreams, maybe? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I will honestly believe in this, but now that I'm reading this, I'm thinking about it, it's entering my mind. Is this thing really out there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like this little earworm that like burrows into your head. Yeah. And like I, I love especially one thing I love the story is just the way the cl- how the climax comes together. Yeah. It's just like so much tension. And oh yeah, so much dread. It's yeah. so much tension. There's so much dread. There's so much building that, like, once it once it hits, and you just have that oh shit moment, where it's just like boom, 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 and then you get to the very ending, and it's like dang. Yeah, well, it was. It was oh, go on. I was gonna say it was just fun pairing this with talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> Because, like, I listened to the Pseudopod episode the same day I saw Talk to Me. Oh, crazy. (laughs) That's a fun mix. And actually, you bring that up, and then, I mean, you bring up, like, It Follows in the the Ring. It just sort of clicked just now reading this, because it it follows that idea, too, of this thing – that kind of gets there and like sort of these rules of like, all right, well we have to actually, I guess we should back up and tell people more about the story, but (laughs) I'll get there in a second, but these certain rules to follow. And even if they're not like official, it's still that idea of kind of like trying to figure out like, all right, well we made this thing. How can we stop it from the same way we made it? You know? So like, the ring it's obviously well you have to record this tape and show this tape to somebody else and it follows is you have to have sex with somebody else and then it starts following them and like this kind of concept of of these kind of unknown rules that we're figuring out because this thing is happening It, it this really follows that concept really well um but anyway we we should the, the story <laughs> we should tell people about that <laughs> um so yeah we have these four people they are all wa- wanting to be writers and so it, the story kind of opens up with them uh sitting around the table and trying this new writing prompt which is sharing paper like you can't use your own notebook you can't use your own pen so you have to share those and then you have to draw a door. It doesn't matter what the door is. And then you have to come up with what's behind that door. And they all sort of come up with the same idea um, while not looking at each other's work. Though we get that scene of like, hey, you copied me. And it's of this, like, it's what was like a train track in the forest and somebody yep. walking towards them. And then that person keeps kind of haunt. Like, they can never fully see who this person is but it keeps sort of getting closer and haunting them and giving them new places, uh, new locations of where it's at. Cause it's a train track. And then it's like, it's a field, like a farm field. Um, and then it gets in their dreams and, and it says something to them in Latin. Um, 
and it's just them trying to figure this thing out because it keeps kind of haunting them. And there's there's more to the story, but that's like the very very basic idea of what's happening. Yep. But I I did like that it we because we're also getting this idea of it's Chris and Leia, right? Lee Lee. Leah, yeah. Yeah, Leah. They were a couple. They're not a couple anymore, but they live in the same apartment. And so you're kind of dealing with that. And then obviously, because it's it's a group of friends, they all sort of are pining for each other in certain ways. And so you're kind of getting that complication as this this writing prompt and this person is is slowly invading their heads. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I thought at first that it was really weird that they would like still share an apartment together after splitting up. But then, but then, then it occurred to me like, if this is the modern times, I mean, I can, I yeah, it makes sense. Rent is rent is high, guys. (laughs) It's it's expensive, and finding a place, I think, aren't they in New York? I think. I wasn't sure where they I were. I wasn't too sure either. No, like, I think, but they're at least in a city, and, you know, city rent is high. Yeah. So, yeah, I, was, I had an apartment in Boston. I had to have two roommates so we could all make rent. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's still, it's, I mean, we've, I remember when it was common, like, in the 90s, like, when you watch Friends, for example, that it was common to have roommates. But then when you got into, like, the 2000s, it was kind of looked down upon, and now you're like, well, I mean, this is normal. Yeah. How else are you, you going to make rent? Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was kind of cute. But I, 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 I also kind of, like, like the idea of... You, you, I mean, you as the reader, you kind of knew how their situation was. But with the rest of the guys, like the rest of the group, or the writing group, they were not. And I'm, I thought it was really interesting. It's like, yeah. I thought you guys were close enough that you would know, but apparently <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I thought yeah. it was kind of, it was funny because I, I laughed or I chuckled at the, at the place where... Chris just looks at Trevor like, I am gay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't have anything towards you, my guy. <laughs> Read the like, room. Right? <laughs> well, and it's just so funny, too. It's just that, like, cliche, like, well, this is our last time on Earth. Right? <laughs> it's like, No. I thought it was hilarious that she addressed it. She was like, this is not the time. Yeah. <laughs> it will never be the time. <laughs> and it's so funny that she could like, I felt a little bit guilty. And I'm like, bitch, don't be guilty. I mean, yeah. he's, been, he's been your friend for like, how long? You should have fucking known this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. That's so funny. <laughs> so funny. Oh, it was just well, nice. That's why I think this is a good, like, this will be a good film because you have the tension, you have the stakes, you have this good, really good group dynamic. Yeah. And then you can, and then you, like, then it mixes in with this kind of humor. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that, even just like that tension, we, we get a lot of it with them in the apartment, just the two of them, and just like, the figuring out of like, how do we make this work? And especially with us dealing with whatever this thing is in our head. And, but you're still kind of getting this like, well, I'm used to, you know, being in the same bed and I'm used to saying these certain things. And these were our kind of our arguments, but now we have something a little bit bigger so we can kind of avoid that stuff. Uh, yeah. It was like, a, just it kind of add it and yeah. maybe more of what's happening there. And, um, yeah, I really liked all of that, and but and, and like again with the short film stuff, I think it's there's a lot of great imagery in this of uh, this thing because not only do you get these visions and what they're writing, uh, all very similar writing of these of what they're seeing, but then once it starts sort of coming out 
of that. So like you get this, there's a scene where they decide they're like, well, we got to do like, let's do it again. And let's see, like, let's see if we're all writing the same thing or if we can make it change. And then that's when like, then there's the knock on the door in which they kind of foretold in the story that they were mm -hmm. all writing. Um, and then just the doorway goes all dark and this the shape grabs uh, one person and it's just, and then the shit, like just a lot of the imagery would just be really cool to see. I know. And it just, it's brought forth so well, like especially that scene when he is pulled into the darkness and you are like, I, I definitely, I just saw it like visually, like, like I was watching a movie, like the camera pans over to yeah, no. Leia and Trevor and you see like how she describes their visual terror is so good. Yeah. Definitely. Like you see, like she's silent, she's like utterly speechless, like Chris is like can't do anything. Trevor is like like his the white, like he's gone completely white, and then Leia vomits. Like <laughs> out, out out of sheer terror. And I'm like, this is exactly how I would see it in a film. In a hundred percent. <laughs> Can we also just talk about the the dread? Just yes. in those passages, like in those like this writing prompts that they're writing. It's it it's like it 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 looks at first like at a first glance it looks really mundane. Yeah. But then as you lean a little bit closer, you see and you and like both you as a reader and you participating as Chris, you see the dread gradually building up yeah and especially when he when he he she keeps like trying to turn away from the prompt but she yes. can't but she has to keep her eyes on the paper yes. like she can't look away and that's it's basically the same as she's just looking at the person who is coming for them yeah well and i yeah exactly that and even just to, like to add on to that too is just that the writing at first for that prompt is very like what you would imagine. Oh, there's a door and maybe there's, you know, it, it, it follows what somebody would be just randomly writing. And then slowly it gets into more detail of this, yeah. of this thing. And, and it's like you said, this dread of like, holy crap, the writing is getting better because they're seeing it better. And, mm. <laughs> and what they're seeing is not great. No, like no. when when the guy just kind of walks past and whispers into her oh, ear, yeah. th that was so creepy. I was like, no. <laughs> Even though it was just this one Latin word, I'm like, no. <laughs> you're, you're like, you're so fucked. Oh, is that the part? Because I'm trying to remember if that was the part or if later when they're trying to write it again they're like well it walked past me and for a moment i was mad that it didn't see me no <laughs> that was stop and... that that was the first time okay because, yeah. yeah because when she goes back she like lay uh, chris decides to go into leia's room and shuffles through her stuff because any axe would probably do that <laughs> and um and she like she finds her like notebook and she finds the word that the guy whispered in his in her ear, so yeah. that it kind of basically is confirmation that Leia is also part of this. Yep. Just yeah, totally and it just scary. spreads from person to person. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it <laughs> uh, yeah. It's great. Like again, following that, like it follows and 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 uh, the ring. It's just this dread of this thing and like it gets to a point where like we get the, almost get a jump scare when they're in their apartment and they look out the window and they see somebody and they realize like it takes a minute to realize who it actually is and you're just like dang it <laughs> got yeah. me um but just that like even that death and um i like because it is they also it, she also gemma files covers the like cop like, when do you call the police? Like, obviously you can't that first time because they're just gone. Yeah. But yeah. then the suicide, you're kind of like, well, crap, I, I had to. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I did like the when she says, like, when the cop gave them a side eye. When, yeah. she was like, when she was like, I know he was in therapy, but I don't know what, what it was for. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell? <laughs> like, she's, she's just giving you information. Why are you giving her the side eye? 
Yeah. <laughs> like she's giving you the information you need. That doesn't make her like a suspect. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. It, oh it's, man, it, I yeah. It I love the way they because the way they try to stop it because that's yes. what I would think to do. Yes, uh, yes, exactly. Well, it's, it's it's the the it's the most logical way they could think of stopping it. Yeah, yeah. That didn't it, involve I, either of their deaths. Right. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Because yeah. that that kind of pops in there too is this idea of like well maybe if i'm just dead it won't follow me anymore um, i mean i mean that was trevor's reasoning yeah <laughs> yeah which makes again this it's a logical it makes logical sense yeah because i mean it's it's uh, it kind of it feels similar and with a final destination mm-hmm because that you know they're trying to uh, like averse death or like trying to get away like hey death's not gonna get me but you know I'm gonna do whatever I can do it and then you know some but someone thinks like well maybe I have to die so this can be broken yeah which doesn't happen <laughs> nope <laughs> it would be horror if it if it would if it would be broken you know yeah exactly. yeah. I mean, it wouldn't. Yeah. It wouldn't. It wouldn't hit as deep. No. Because we 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 usually get these kind of movies like, hey, we broke the curse, and then you're like, yay. Yeah. Uh, it, I think like, I, I like my. I was gonna say some of my favorite horror stuff is the stuff that like we can't beat. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like the person, the person, is even even from the get go, they're just in over their heads. Yes. Yeah. Like, like, I, I, I love that. Yeah. Like, have you guys ever seen The Last Prayer? Yeah. No. I mentioned it a couple months ago, I think, on the podcast. But it's about these guys who are going into, like, this church that was used in pagan rituals a long time ago when weird things are happening. And by by the end, it turns out what's the church is built upon something deeper in in the ground that's living and mm. it lures the two exorcists or the exorcist and his friend uh, his partner deeper to its depths where they find themselves in a room where babies are sacrificed to this being <laughs> and they go down further and they find themselves in the beast digestive system oh, where oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, everything yeah, yeah. closes behind them and they just begin getting dissolved. <laughs> so messed up. It's so messed up, but it's also it's like I love it because it's like from the start, they have no idea what they're getting into. And they think they know. And as the audience, we think we know. And then by the end, we're like, oh, they had no chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah I love those. Yeah. Like this and is like- it it's yeah, it's similar to like the descent. Oh, I love the especially that original. You know yeah. when they first released the Descent in America, they made a happy ending. I know, I heard of that. I <laughs> fortunately did not see that. I saw the other one, and it I love that. It, it took me five years to see the real ending. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the real but, ending is amazing. It's amazing, though. The real ending is fantastic. <laughs> Well, and I, I just like that we, a, c- a couple things I really like about this. One is it really doesn't have, at least that we know of, like is motivation. It's just doing its thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we don't, at which guy ties into this, like they're doomed from the start. We really don't know what it wants to say, stop it. You know, that's usually in some of these things where you're like, oh, I just have to do this one thing and it, we're free. Um but it never gives up like what it's doing and which then leads to the second thing that I really like is it seems like it's just, it was just there. Like they didn't, I, even though I, I, they do tie up to the tie to this, uh, Tulupa thing, Mm -hmm. um, which is the, you know, I, I had to look it up, but (laughs) the spirit that kind of comes possibly from intense concentration and stuff like that. But this idea that it's sort of just always been lurking in whatever, I don't know 
this creative world that you people have like it's like mm-hmm. the negative muse or something like that where it's just there and like they just happen to open up a door to it but like it, it's it maybe it's always there yeah i think i think you have a point there i think it's just this is a thing that exists within all of us and if you just kind of summon it just yeah. either by either by intent or just by accident it just it's something there which is horrifying <laughs> for me if you th- if you, if you think about it this could be like a writer's block being just yeah just being into like put into being yes well and that's that's really interesting because i like i think the first time i read this that's kind of where my mind was going. It was reading this more of, of as like a writer and like mm-hmm. reading it as somebody dealing with that either for, for them in this story, it's just, they all want to be, but they haven't really, they, they've had like little publishing uh, credits, but they, they've never really moved beyond that. And, mm-hmm. and seeing this thing as that kind of, uh, like either what's holding you back or yeah what's keeping you because i guess that that yeah you, you really like i think that's what the start of this whole idea of using a shut door is they just couldn't come up with anything yeah and i so think this, yeah. so you created a being out of writer's block yeah and is, you and it you can get these kind of like hints throughout the story like especially at towards the end when chris and leia are trying to put an end to this and they think like one of their logical um, ideas is to just keep writing and try to write it out of existence yeah and they can't they like they physically can't like chris gets a cramp but she just i can't write anymore <laughs> yes. it's like i can't because i brought it into being and i can't like snuff it out yeah or even like yeah. when when they try coming up with like oh well don't give it a door think of a, a wall or think of yeah, something yeah, yeah. else and like it still sort of steers it that way um yeah it, which totally is that and it's interesting also if, if you follow matt Carden on twitter he or his Substack, he's been doing a lot about this kind of writer's muse and pulling out all these famous writers and like what their muses are and how all that goes and you bring this up made me think of that too. It's just this idea of trying to control it, of trying to control how your story goes or control your writer's block and, and how sometimes you can't, your muse is gonna go one way and you no matter what you do, you can't stop it from making your characters do a certain thing or make your story do a certain thing. And that's what she seems like she's doing here where she's like, you can, you can try to come up with a wall, but that just means it's going to be in every wall. Mm-hmm. So that's fascinating that you bring that up. And then, I mean, and, yeah. Yeah, go go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that leads us to our our own ending of this story, which is we all have it. Yep. And like how Chris basically suggests is just don't think of anything. Just be a yeah. blank. <laughs> Just be a blank. Just be a blank. Think of nothing. And you're like, this is like the same as how he's like, don't pet the dangerous animal. And then you're like, yeah. have this huge ass urge. Like, but I, I can't, when you say not to, I kind of have to now. Yeah. So it's kind of counterintuitive, you know? Yeah. So when you like, when she ends with Kent, they're like, don't think of anything. And I'm like, well, I'm thinking a lot of things now. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> not think about it <laughs> no it's like ask creatives how can we be blank right <laughs> and that, like that's yeah. that's my worst fucking nightmare <laughs> yes exactly it's <laughs> like i'd rather have that monster because i can write about that monster as opposed to nothing yeah yeah <laughs> but yeah i mean I, as, I, as, I, as, long, as long as i don't get leia's faith i'm, I'm <laughs> I know that one's so good too. It just comes out of the floor. Yep. <laughs> I was like, and just like right in front of you. Like, this is what I'm saying. Like, this is like such a perfect thing. Like, Gemma, I don't know if you're going to listen, but please, if you can, turn it into a script. 
it's good. <laughs> and I think this is going to be an awesome film. Oh, yeah, totally. It's, it's, yeah, I think this would be amazing. No, this was awesome. I'm glad we, I'm glad we covered this one. Yeah, me, me too. I mean, I'm definitely going to read more of Gemini after this. I'm always so happy that I get to know more authors and their stories. <laughs> right? It's always fun to discover somebody new. And, and like I said, like, she does this really, and this is the example of just doing this really cool thing of, making you more involved and I think that's such a cool and uh unique way to write stuff and and get you more engaged in those stories and it sticks in your head because you'll always be thinking about this now mm -hmm. this is just I don't know it, it goes to show why Gemma is just one of the best short story writers working right now in in horror mm -hmm. also I also made a joke in in the Midwest, when when you grew up, Matt, did they play the uh, game where if you ever thought about the game, you lose the game? Or is that like a, a dumb New England? Play? Oh, my God. Even I know that thing. Yes. It's like that. <laughs> like that. You've lost the game. I fucking hate this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, I don't know if I've ever played that before. <laughs> Philomena's. Yep. It's the most annoying shit in the world. It is. My God. But, uh, <laughs> Villa Bay, where can listeners get in touch with you? Well, I'm still on hiatus on social media. Um, but if people want to get in touch, like send me a DM or something like that, they can get in touch with me on Twitter. Or should we call it X now? I kind of don't want to. I know. Uh, I have no idea. Yeah, so it's I have no still, idea anymore. I'm I'm I want to keep Larry the Bird, so I'm gonna be on the Larry the Bird app <laughs> as right. Vitle S. Yeah. And Matt, what about you? Uh, yeah, I, I'm there too at Brandenburg DM. I'm also there too at Rudy Five Thirty Eighty Eight, and be sure to give Abyssal Fault add into staring. And this is Richard Gerlach saying, "Be a blank." <laughs>